Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. This webinar is a presentation of Clean Energy Group and the Clean Energy States Alliance. And our topic for this webinar is the McKnight Lane Project. It is a rural, low income, zero energy, solar plus storage housing project located in Waltham, Vermont. And you can see a little picture of it there. We'll have a lot more pictures for you throughout the webinar. And uh, we have some excellent guest speakers. Before we get started, I'd like to go through a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our participants for this webinar are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to connect to the audio portion of the webinar. You can either call in using a telephone, or you can connect using your computer's mic and speakers. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions as you think of them at any point throughout the webinar by typing them into the question box on your webinar console and hitting send. We will be reading through your questions as they come in, and we will be saving some time for a Q&A with the audience at the end of our presentations. So since we have a lot of people that we're expecting to join us for this webinar, please just type your questions in when you think of them. Um, we'll read through them, and that just gives you a better chance of getting your question answered. Uh, final note, this webinar is being recorded. You will find a recording of this webinar, uh, along with our many previous webinars, um, on our website at some of the links that you see on your screen. And so with that, I'd like to pass it over to our host for this webinar, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd is a project director with Clean Energy Group and the Clean Energy State Alliance, and he will be uh, introducing this webinar and introducing our guest speakers. Todd? Thanks, Samantha. Hi, this is Todd Olinsky-Paul with Clean Energy States Alliance and Clean Energy Group, and uh, welcome to the webinar. This is one of the most popular webinars that we've had judging from the red level of registration, so we expect a really good turnout. So uh, welcome, everybody. This is, I think, um, a unique project that we're going to be presenting about today. It's a rural uh, affordable housing redevelopment project where the uh, units are high efficiency uh, modulars that are equipped with solar and storage behind each uh, behind the meter in each individual home and they are able to island and self-supply with electricity in case of a grid outage and they're also able to be used or called upon by the utility uh, Green Mountain Power during uh, peak demand times and that will that helps to pay for the system so it's it's um, there's a lot to absorb there's a lot of information about how this project came to be how it was developed and uh, we have an excellent set of panelists to explain all that to you I'm going to start with a little uh, introduction of our organization and projects and programs and then we will go through introductions of the in individual presenters and then the presentations themselves Clean Energy States Alliance is a uh, member organization. It's a nonprofit. It is comprised of a number of, of state clean energy funds. As you can see on the slide, there are many states that are members. And we basically work with those state agencies to help them with their clean energy uh, programs. Next slide, please. And I think I have a slide here on STAP. Samantha, can you advance the slide, please? There we go. STAP is a project of Clean Energy States Alliance. It's actually our energy storage technology advancement partnership, which we conduct under contract with Sandia National Laboratories. It's funded by US DOE Office of Electricity. And this is a project where we work with states and the National Lab and uh, DOE and municipalities to deploy energy storage projects all over the country. You can see on the map there's a large number of projects that are active right now and uh, this uh, the one that we're presenting today is one. Next slide please. Samantha, can you advance the slide please? Okay, um, 
Samantha, are you able to advance the slide? Yeah, they're just going slow. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just go on and introduce the Clean Energy Group, which I think is the next slide. Uh, Clean Energy Group is a nonprofit uh, sister agency to CESA and uh, also works on, obviously on clean energy projects and on energy storage, specifically solar and storage and in use as a resilient power technology. Uh, clean energy groups work in this area as foundation funded largely and uh, again clean energy group supports projects uh, all over the country as well as uh, policy development and research and so forth. Next slide please. Well, I apologize for the slowness of the of the slides. I'm not sure what's going on, but it seems like a technical glitch. Okay, I'm seeing notices here that from people saying the slides are advancing fine for the audience, so I'm going to assume that you're seeing the next slide, and I'll just go ahead. Uh, so <clears throat> the resilient power, uh, just go ahead and advance to the next one, please, Samantha. Um, you, you may have seen on, on the slide a number of our reports that we make available. Those are all available freely on the website as are our archived past webinars and all the other work that we do. Um, it's all available for download or review on our website. I think I'm going to go ahead and introduce the speakers, although I don't see the slides advancing. I'm assuming that you are seeing those, so I'm going to go ahead with the brief speaker introductions. Uh, we have <clears throat> several speakers today. We start with Elise Schonbacher. She's the executive director of the Addison County Community Trust, which is a nonprofit organization in rural Vermont dedicated to providing safe, affordable housing for low and moderate income residents. Elise also serves on the board of the Vermont Community Development Association, and she was previously a senior workforce development policy analyst at the National Governors Association Center for Best Practices. She's also served as a board member for a local chapter of Habitat for Humanity. After Elise, we're going, uh, she's going to speak about the, the sort of the housing aspect of this project, uh, the redevelopment of what was a defunct and abandoned mobile home uh, park into a high efficiency modular home development. Then we will have Peter Schneider, a senior consultant at Vermont Energy Investment Corporation in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, he is going to talk a bit more about the about the energy and efficiency aspects of these homes. Peter is, uh, he provides technical support to builders, architects, engineers, affordable housing agencies, and ho uh, homeowners participating in a number of different programs, including Efficiency Vermont Certified High Performance Homes, Lead for Homes, and Mid-Rise and Passive House. He is a certified energy rater, a passive house consultant, and a Lead for Homes Quality Assurance designee, and his current focus is running the state's mobile home replacement program. Following Peter's presentation, we will hear from Craig Ferreira, uh, Craig is with Green Mountain Power. He's part of the Energy Innovation Development Team. And Green Mountain Power is the utility uh, serving the site and also the owner of the batteries. Uh, Craig is committed to researching and developing programs and product offerings that transform the way GNP interacts with customers in order to save them money. He's also devoted to creating a smarter grid while fostering a change in the traditional electric utility model to one that is greener and sustainable over the long term. And I think as part of that, he'll be addressing in today's presentation the way that GMP can draw on these batteries to reduce their costs for uh, services such as capacity and transmission that they have to purchase. And by doing so, help to pay for the uh, initial cost of, of purchasing and installing the batteries. Um, Finally, we will hear from Olaf Lohr, the Director of Business Development for Sonnen, which is the supplier of the batteries. Sonnen is the U.S. branch of Sonnen Group, which is headquartered in Bavaria, Germany. Olaf has background in international businesses and market development with over 14 years of experience in market research, market entry, and market expansion into the United States. He provides leadership for the company's expansion 
and is primarily focused on developing new energy storage markets for the commercial utility and financing sectors through the implementation of pilot projects and key partnerships. So that brings us, I think, to our uh, core presentations. We're going to start with Elise. We will take as many questions as we can after all the presentations are done. So send them in now, please, and I will be sorting through those and lining them up uh, to be addressed at the end. Uh, one thing I want to mention uh, before we go into this, into the first presentation, uh, we're doing a little uh, crowdsourcing experiment here. We, we're looking to expand and replicate this project. Uh, uh, something that should be replicable in other parts of the country, uh, in Vermont, in the Northeast, and, and elsewhere. And it's essentially a way that um, behind the meter storage and renewables can, can be harnessed by utilities uh, to generate cost savings while allowing the tenants of the homes to get benefits from those systems. And it's a, it's a very interesting model. And what we're looking for is input on how to, uh, how to replicate this, how to build this model out for, for replication in other areas. So uh, you see a set of questions there on this slide. We're looking to, to get answers. And if you have thoughts on this or comments, feel free to let us know or, or contact us after the webinar. Um, but but things like, you know, does the federal government have an important role? Does the national manufactured housing industry have an interest in this model? Uh, what roles can utilities, state energy funds, housing development agencies play? Uh, what are the options for financing? And what other questions do we need to ask and answer to create a robust national market for this type of housing? So as you listen to the presentations, um, if you have some uh, thoughts on this, please uh, please contact us either through the question console or or separately by email. Okay, I'm going to pass this over to our first pr pr first presenter, Elise, and uh, take it away, Elise. Thanks, Todd. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm Elise Shanbacker. I'm the executive director of the Addison County Community Trust. Um, so we are a uh, local 501c3 nonprofit. We develop, own, and operate affordable housing, uh, and that includes um, mobile home parks, multifamily housing, um, some senior housing, and a single-family program. Um, so I thought I would kick off uh, with just a little bit of um, local context for uh, folks that aren't familiar with our area. Um, we have a gap between the median rent um, of a two-bedroom apartment and uh, what of a lot of our uh, residents can afford. Um, our median renter household in the county makes about $35,000 a year and can afford about $875 a month in housing costs, including their utilities, um, compared with over a thousand uh, dollars median household rent. Um, we also have a very low vacancy rate. A healthy vacancy rate is around 5%. In our county, we've got under 1% vacancy. Um, so we are working to increase the supply of affordable units. Um, some of the conditions that lead to our uh, rent or household population that's very cost burdened. 45% um, pay more than 30% of their incomes towards rent, and 22% pay more than half of their income towards rent and utilities. Um, we have about 100 people who might be homeless on any given night. Um, about 11% poverty rate, which is an income of about $11,500 to $24,000 annually, depending on household size. And our 2015 housing needs assessment um, identified a need for about 1,200 additional rental units serving households earning 80% or less of area median income. And over 1,000 of those are needed at uh, a level that's affordable to um, households earning 60% or less of area median income, which is what McKnight Lane is targeted at. 
So as I mentioned, we develop, own, and operate uh, multifamily housing in the county. That includes about 270 multifamily units, either owned or operated, uh, including um, Pete Co. Village Apartments in Middlebury, which is the top photo, just to give you a sense of what some of our housing looks like. It's really high quality housing. Um, we have 340 mobile home lots in nine parks. We also do a single family program, which you can see there. And we're starting to get into providing um, services for some of our residents, starting with seniors. And this just shows you sort of the scale on the county level, that we have a little over 600 units um, out of about 3,500 total renter, renter households. So we're a significant chunk um, of the, uh, the you know, landlord. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're a significant landlord in the county, but the private sector still plays a big role, which is where a lot of that, I think, cost burden um, comes in, and it's a very old energy and efficient housing stock as well, um, compared with about 1,500 cost burden renter households and households in poverty, so we still have some, some work to do. Um, who we serve, uh, almost two-thirds of our residents. This is based on 2014, but it hasn't changed much. Um, over two-thirds of our residents uh, are what's considered extremely low income, earning less than 30% of area median res uh, income. And then 90% uh, of our residents are below 60% of median. So that brings us to McKnight Lane. Um, this is a really interesting project as it kind of um, bridges two of our core areas, mobile home parks and um, multifamily housing. This is a bit of a hybrid model in most of our mobile home parks. Um, residents own their homes and we own the land and they pay lot rent. Um, in order to redevelop this mobile home park, we reimagined it as a rental community using the low income housing tax credit program primarily along with other, many other funding sources, which I'll get to in a bit. So. This particular park had been vacant uh, for at least five years. Um, it had never successfully been able to convert to nonprofit ownership um, or co-op ownership. And over time, the units had become abandoned and were really a blight on the community. And not only were they a blight on the community, this is a county where ACCT is adding, on average, 10 new units a year. Um, and this park uh, was home to 14 units. There were 13 abandoned mobile homes on it when ACCT acquired it in, in uh, 26, early 2016. Um, and, uh, and so to lose 13 units of housing is, you know, outpacing um, our new development. So, uh, you know, preservation of these housing units was really important to us. Um, and uh, one, one of the advantages that, that keeping it um, as a mobile home park, it configured as a mobile home park was uh, really a, had to do with zoning as well as the um, good timing of having the Vermont program in Vermont, which uh, Peter and others are going to talk about a bit more later. So we demolished these 13 vacant, blighted mobile home parks. There was site contamination we had to clean up. Um, and this is what we ended up with afterwards. Um, 14 brand new net zero affordable units. Um, about a mile from downtown Virgins, which is a city of a little over 2,000 people. Uh, our whole county has about 38,000. Um, and these units rent for $775 a month for a two bedroom and $850 a month for a three bedroom, um, including all utilities. Uh, which, as you can remember from a couple slides back, is um, affordable for the median renter in the household uh, in the county. Um, it feature it has a lot of universal design features. It's all on uh, one level. There are two uh, fully ADA accessible units. Um, we reached substantial completion last month um, and have ten of the units leased, and the other four are in process. Um, in terms of uh, who lives here and the impact that this is having on the community to return these housing, uh, housing units to, um, uh, to their use as affordable housing, 
Um, we are leasing up three formerly homeless families. It's a mix of seniors, individuals, and families with children. Um, we had a little gathering for the residents who have moved in so far last week and um, just talking to some of them, some of the things I heard. I didn't have our release form with me, so I changed their names. Um, but uh, one of them uh, moved in from a private, an old privately owned mobile home um, that uh, was really drafty and she could barely afford to heat. Um, so this was like night and day for her. Um, and then uh, one of the uh, senior who moved in uh, who uses oxygen said that even just in a month of living there, his breathing had already noticeably improved. Um, so this is really being a huge benefit for the community. Um, just a few more things that aren't on here. Um, the average income of a household so far uh, at this property is about $22,000 a year. Um, but there's a pretty big range. It's uh, about $7,000 a year to $32,000 a year. Um, it's a mix of uh, some uh, maybe uh, full-time employed people, some retirees, um, and some part-time employed people. Um, so it's, it's really a mix. Um, and then I just have a, a short video which shows um, the site plan and I think really gives you a much better sense for um, what this community is. So while it's playing, I should um, talk a little bit about ACCT's development partner on this project, um, Cathedral Square Corporation. I've obviously been talking a little bit more about the housing and who lives there and the impact it's having. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, too, about the development and how it came together. Um, most of that work was done by Cathedral Square, um, uh, also a nonprofit housing provider based in South Burlington. Um, they specialize in senior housing, but they're also getting into um, very energy efficient housing. They're building Vermont's first um, passive house multifamily uh, development um, as well this year. So it was really exciting to, um, to partner with them. Um, they uh, have a little bit more detail on the ins and outs of the development budget, but I'll certainly do my best to talk about how all of that came together. So as you can see, this is, uh, video was taken um, before we were uh, quite complete. There were still two duplexes left to move in, but um, it really gives you a, a sense, I think, of um, how, the, how the development came together. And, our nice tent there. That's not a permanent installation, but this was for our uh, ribbon cutting back on October 19th. And of course, the battery, which I'm sure people are really anxious to hear more about. So uh, in our beautiful setting up here in Vermont. Let me get out of this. Okay, so um, a few of the development details. Uh, the uh, total development cost was approximately $3.7 million, which works out to a little bit over $260,000 a unit, um, which is right in the range of other Vermont Housing Finance Agency funded um, projects in Vermont, the difference with this one being that it's net zero. So, um, uh, it's great that we were able to achieve such a high level of energy efficiency um, and not have a huge increase in um, development costs as a result. Um, so <laughs> I didn't even have room to list all of our funders. Um, the uh, uh, alphabet soup is uh, kind of to make the point that we had um, a lot of help and a lot of funders in pulling this all together. Some of our traditional sources um, when we set out to build a development is usually Low Income Housing Tax Credit, HOME, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, um, and Vermont Community Development Program. Um, to get the energy efficiency um, features of this development, we had help from Efficiency Vermont, from D-Light, from the Clean Energy Development Fund. Um, uh, the High Meadows Fund and GMP and Sonnen, um, which folks are going to talk about a little bit later in the presentation too, um, how those sources came together to um, make sure that these units, you know, not only were super energy efficient, as, as Peter will talk about in a minute, but also had um, 
uh, were energy generating with solar and resilient with the battery. Um, and we also <laughs> we also had to clean up a contaminated site. So we also had the Petroleum Cleanup Fund, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and the Department of Environmental Conservation. So this was really um, a huge community effort. And that is it for my slides, and I know we're going to do questions and discussion at the end. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to the next speaker. Okay, thanks very much, Elise. And I think we're going to go right on into our next speaker. So if we have those slides queued up, I'll just turn it on over to the next speaker. Great. Um, this is Peter Schneider. I'm, I'm with Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, and we run um, the state of Vermont's energy efficiency utility, which is Efficiency Vermont, and uh, that is how I became involved in this project. Um, I run the state's mobile home replacement program, and uh, also work with um, you know a lot of residential new construction programs from single family market rate housing to to you know multifamily affordable housing projects. So um, this project is um, you know a sort of outgrowth of our mobile home replacement program, but also a lot of our sort of uh, affordable housing multifamily projects, and combines the two. So um, I just want to give a quick bit of background in regards to this sort of housing sector and its importance, not only in Vermont, but nationally. Um, and then I'll get into some details on um, the overall approach uh, to housing for this development and our, and our mobile home replacement program. So um, as you can see here, you know, mobile home parks um, and, and manufactured housing, um, just to uh, provide a definition for those two mobile homes and manufactured housing, pretty much the same thing. Um, the, the true definition would suggest that manufactured housing is any home on a permanent steel chassis uh, built after 1976 when there was a, a code enforced for that housing. Mobile homes were built prior to 1976. So um, I'll use mobile homes throughout this um, presentation uh, just to simplify things. So. You know, we have mobile homes in parks. We have mobile homes on private land. You can see, uh, you know, 22 million Americans living in these homes, which uh, really represent um, a, a large percentage of our sort of affordable home ownership um, in, in the United States. Uh, in Vermont, it's about 7% uh, of our housing stock. Uh, nationally, it's about 6%, uh, but there are some states you know, closer to 20%. There are some counties where it represents over 50% of the housing. So um, the problem with this, this home ownership model is that, um, you know, it, it's poor housing, particularly the older mobile homes. So shorter lifespans, um, durability issues, high energy costs, um, and they have been shown to lose value over time. That is, they depreciate similar to a car. So we wanted to redefine this housing sector uh, with a more sustainable solution that would help homeowners um, build wealth over time and um, resolve some of the other issues, um, such as comfort issues, um, health uh, issues, and um, certainly trying to get folks into a home that's less vulnerable to um, energy cost escalation and maintenance issues. So here you can just see some of the existing housing stock we work with, um, you know, ducts that are exposed under the bellies of these mobile homes with pest, um, pest infiltration, um, you know, really poor envelopes, as you can see there with the two-inch walls. And uh, this stuff is still out there. Um, about 30% of the mobile home housing stock across the U.S. Uh, you know, is pre-1976. So uh, that wall section there is not far from what you'd find in a lot of mobile home parks. So um, one of the issues we had was that the new mobile homes, also known as manufactured homes, have a lot of the same issues. Um, they're built to a federally 
uh, mandated uh, preemptive code that doesn't meet many states' uh, bare minimum energy code, uh, nor does the Energy Star version of a manufactured home. And so we tried to build uh, a design and then build a manufactured home that would meet our state's requirements, but we couldn't do that with the industry. So we had to look elsewhere and um, decided to explore building a modular home instead. And a modular home, uh, the, the difference is it is manufactured in a factory inside in a climate-controlled environment, uh, but the home is just delivered on a steel chassis on a trailer, and it is um, set on a permanent frost-protected foundation, typically lifted with a crane off the trailer and set, as this home shown in the slide is. So what we provided here is um, a home that has much higher level of quality with regards to the craftsmanship and the durability. It's really a, a maintenance-free home, uh, you know, for um, you know extended period of time. Very low maintenance with regards to the interior and exterior finishes and products that are used. Uh, we incorporate fresh air ventilation systems. That's a balanced heat recovery ventilation system. Um, we put in healthy materials that meet the EPA's Indoor Air Plus standard, and um, you know we're really looking at energy efficiency and the, the asset value of that home down the road and looking to provide these homeowners with a home that will either hold its value over time or even appreciate. So um, this just shows you know one of our homes out there that reflects uh, these various measures. And, uh, you know, we're really looking at homes instead of the typical manufactured home lifespan of, say, 30 years or so, you know, we're really talking about, you know, 100-year-plus homes um, that will serve homeowners and, and generations after that. So um, Waltham, Vermont, um, we're in, you know, the northeast. It's very cold. Um, our design temperature, so, you know, 99% of the time, uh, the coldest temperature, negative 4 degrees. Um, we have pretty good solar radiation, um, not as good as Nevada, but um, very good, certainly when compared to, say, all of Western Europe. Um, the design load for this home, sort of worst case condition in regards to the heating we need, which is our main concern in this climate, is about 7,000 BTUs per hour, so that's very low, and that's a result of uh, the details that I'll show you. And um, it just called out the climate zone, which is 6A, so, you know, similar to what you'd find in northern Illinois, Wisconsin, uh, uh, you know, with uh, some of the northern belts across the country. So how do we get to a point where um, we can have an all-electric home that uses very little uh, energy? You can see the difference between a typical mobile home, uh, a new manufactured home, and then a zero-energy modular home. Um, you know, we're more than doubling the R values throughout, uh, we're putting in triple glazed windows, uh, we have that balanced heat recovery ventilation, and um, we're taking the ducts and the plumbing out of the thermal envelope, so we, we put those inside the home in a special soffit or chase. Uh, so for one, they're not exposed to the outside elements, but also uh, they're not compromising uh, the insulation levels throughout the house. And, um, you know, we just really reduce our heating and cooling requirements uh, via these conservation measures. So when we do that, we're able to incorporate um, our efficient mechanical and electrical systems. And I call them out here, and I'll just note them. But we use a cold climate heat pump uh, for our heating and our cooling. Uh, we have no backup heating. Uh, we've been doing this for, you know, about the last so seven or eight years since uh, they started making um, ductless cold climate heat pumps that worked in very cold temperatures. So these units we've watched work very effectively down below, you know, negative 20 degrees, uh, which is about as cold as it gets here for a very short period of time. Uh, we couple that with our conditioning energy recovery ventilation unit, uh, heat pump water heater. Um, you'll see the roof-mounted photovoltaic panels. That's typically somewhere around a 5.5 to 7 KW system. In Waltham, we put a 6 KW system on that and then combine that with uh, advanced energy storage for this project. Um, this is a rental housing project, but I'd just like to note sort of this housing approach and how it differs from 
the typical very low first cost uh, but higher life cycle cost. And I, I encourage folks to look at all these old Volkswagen advertisements out there, and many of them apply to what we're trying to do with this uh, zero energy modular housing. But the idea that this is more expensive house uh, than a typical manufactured home, uh, but I like to think of it as, you know, that it's cheaper at twice the price when you look at total cost of ownership. And it's important to factor that in uh, particularly with our, our sort of vulnerable populations where, you know, they benefit the most from energy efficiency and renewable energy. Uh, so you can see here, um, when we factor in the fact that we can get better financing, um, we're eliminating uh, energy usage uh, for the most part. Uh, we can incorporate some incentives. Uh, we provide uh, energy efficiency incentives for, for meeting certain tiers of construction. Um, and renewable energy incentives with our state incentive program, you know, we can really drive down the monthly cash flow and the cost of that zero energy modular unit when compared to a typical manufactured home. Uh, so here you can see energy and mortgage for a typical manufactured home month one is more expensive than that zero energy modular home month one, even though it's twice the cost. Uh, so really, um, high savings potential here. You can see um, this is a brand new manufactured home, uh, somewhere around 80 to 100 million BTUs per year. Those homes utilize, uh, you know, with the zero mo energy modular approach, we, we really do eliminate fossil fuel usage and, and pretty much eliminate energy usage as well. Some homeowners, of course, will use a little bit more energy than we anticipate. Some will use a little bit less. Uh, but the homes are designed to produce as much energy as they use. And, um, you know, we can be really flexible. Uh, so mobile home park lots, there are all different shapes and sizes, the same with private land. So this is just a modular home, and there's all sorts of configurations um, that we can utilize this approach to accommodate that lot and that homeowner's needs. So we started this effort with a, uh, a very typical 14 by 70 foot design, two bedroom, two bath. You know, we then did some two box homes like this one here, about 50 feet in length. A couple of 13 foot boxes put together allows for a little bit more living space. Again, these homes are almost complete when they're delivered to the site, so there's very little site work, which keeps the cost down. And um, so we came across McKnight Lane, and you can see, this is a nice bird's eye view of what the existing site looked like. Beautiful site, those 13 mobile homes. Uh, but that existing site had a number of issues. The, the, the homes were very short. There were already some setback issues. It was pretty confined in regards to what we could do. Uh, so we looked at a number of different uh, approaches, uh, one being just matching the footprints that were there, uh, but that that didn't serve the site as well as um, doubling up the homes. And this is just a street view, and uh, Ali showed a couple of shots of that. Um, but what we did is we created a common wall, and we created duplexes. And um, you can see a couple of the example floor plans here, a, a two-bedroom, one-bath that meets uh, accessibility requirements, ADA, um, and a very different one below, two-bedroom, one-bath. There's a three-bedroom, one-bath as well, and uh, nice open living spaces and uh, very livable homes, uh, and these sit on full crawl spaces. So this, this uh, reduced the, the overall footprint to accommodate the homes and um, allowed for more green space on the site and uh, met all the setback requirements um, with regards to the neighboring properties. So here you can see a, a crane set of one of the duplexes going in. You can see an existing crawl space there with the piers. And, um, you know, we put in real frost-protected foundations there, uh, perimeter drainage, and, um, you know, really resilient um, connection to the ground when compared to a home sitting on a slab um, on a steel chassis. A little rendering of what that looked like, a, a picture down below of uh, a couple of those units side by side. Um, if folks are familiar with home energy ratings, um, this, you know, ran through 
Efficiency Vermont's residential new construction program. This these units um, they vary a little bit, but um, this unit here earned a home energy rating index of one. Um, so zero being basically a, a zero energy home, and you can see you know a typical new homes up around you know 90 or 100, and um, you know an energy star homes or I say our average homes in Vermont might be in the the 50 to 60 range. So um, that's with a solar PV system on there. Without the solar PV, these homes are about a hers index of 40 or so. Um, so here's the solar array. What's nice about this is, um, you know, orientation is not as important in Vermont. We typically uh, install a solar electric system at about latitude or 45 degrees facing true south, which is about 15 degrees west um, of magnetic south. But um, not every one of our existing mobile home sites accommodates uh, the right um, orientation of the house. And so by doing a a very um, low, shallow pitch roof. We can orient these homes any which way. We maximize solar gains in the spring, summer, and fall, and we're not as concerned about solar production in the winter months when we have um, far more clouds and snow. Some interior finish shots. Again, just a reminder that we're really thinking about everything here. So um, all these materials, like no VOC paints, no adhesives in the flooring, um, you know, no urea formaldehyde in the cabinets, vanities, countertops. You can see that we, we have a front-loading washer dryer. That's actually a heat pump ventless dryer. When you make homes um, almost completely airtight, if folks are familiar with blower door tests where you depressurize the home to check for air infiltration rates, um, these homes are, are around the passive house level. With regards to air tightness, um, the homes at McKnight Lane averaged a blower door test of about 50 CFM, uh, 50, 50 cubic feet per minute, minute at 50 Pascal, so very tight. Um, we put in ventless dryers, and in this case, heat pump dryers. Um, mechanical room on the right with our ventilation system, uh, filtering both fresh air coming in and return air coming back from the house and our heat pump water heater. Um, our battery systems, Sonin, uh, that's actually an 8KWH um, Sonin battery here uh, with the interior shot for lithium-ion Sonin, Sonin batteries there, and um, Craig will expand upon that. And uh, just wanted to share that uh, this approach, there's a lot of flexibility with regards to the design, so we've got our duplex is at McKnight, and we have a number of sort of single-wide, double-wide options, but we're doing these cottages now on sites that are uh, too small to accommodate um, like a typical mobile home. Um, and there are a lot of mobile home lots that are similar to that. So um, I appreciate every, everyone's time and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions at the, uh, the end of the presentations. Thank you. All right, thanks, Peter. This is Craig, everybody. How's it going? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, more about the uh, utility side of things. Uh, my name is, again, is Craig Ferrer. I work for Green Mountain Power uh, out of our Energy Innovation Center down in Rutland, Vermont. I'm going to touch upon three, uh, three main aspects of the project as it relates to us, uh, the McKnight Lane customers and the rest of GMP's customers. Uh, so we're going to talk about the, the overall storage benefits for uh, GMP as a utility. Uh, and the rest of our customers. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, specifics about the benefits to the customers in these Vermont homes. Uh, and then I'll share a little bit about our control sharing strategy and how we derive value from energy storage on our grid. <clears throat> so first thing I want to show you is just here's a map of Green Mountain Power's distribution network. 
Uh, you can see what we're showing here is uh, the constraints due to uh, high levels of uh, PV installation penetration. So uh, you can see the areas in red. Uh, we have a lot of uh, installs of solar, whether it be uh, residential or uh, a little bit uh, larger grid scale, uh, where we really have constraints because of that. Uh, you can see that I've blown up a, a section of the map here, uh, the largest red section. Uh, which happens to be where the McKnight Lane project took place. So uh, it's really a, a great opportunity for us to test some energy storage uh, in this area uh, to try to help alleviate some of this constraint. Um, so, so the way energy storage <coughs> helps with the grid constraint is that it's, it's able to soak up any excess uh, solar generation that is being put onto our grid. Generally, uh, you know, household solar or, or grid scale is being, is being transferred to our grid uh, which requires infrastructure that can handle that. Uh, when there's too much, then we need to start making upgrades uh, to the grid, uh, which can become costly. So by putting energy storage out there, uh, we can soak up that extra uh, and, and kind of alleviate some of those costs. Uh, and then as the solar kind of ramps down in the afternoon, evening hours, and people start getting home from work, uh, the daily peaks uh, of energy start to occur uh, we can then start discharging the batteries back onto the grid to help uh, to help provide the, any additional uh, needs for consumption. Uh, the McKnight Lane project is a total uh, for GMP is a total of 86 kilowatt hours, uh, so that's a pretty significant uh, size battery when when all together. Um, what this does, uh, considering that each of these has uh, six kilowatts of solar on the roof. Uh, it's able to make sure that these new homes are not adding to the constraints on the grid. Uh, if we were to have just put solar in without the, uh, excuse me, storage without the solar, then we're also providing opportunity to, uh, for others to, to put PV on their rooftops uh, in an area of constraint because we're able to uh, alleviate some of that congestion. The primary way uh, that GMP is deriving value uh, from energy storage right now is, is through peak shaving and demand response. Uh, so as Todd had mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, the way we help pay for the, the battery portion of the project is, is through these, uh, these peak shaving demand response programs. Uh, we have one event every year in New England. Uh, it's in the summer generally, um, and then one every month. Uh, we have a peak event in Vermont. Uh, it's a little bit smaller scale, but basically these events, uh, they cost GMP and, and really our customers money. So to the extent that we can reduce the amount of energy that we're contributing during those times, we can reduce our costs across the board, uh, which helps keep our rates uh, stagnant, or stagnant or even lower them in some cases. Uh, so energy storage is able to uh, by controlling it, we're able to dispatch the batteries either into the home, effectively taking it off of the grid for a period of time, or if the home's energy is satisfied, we can dispatch the batteries back onto the grid uh, and avoid having to fire up uh, peaker plants that are costly and expensive to run, uh, not to mention dirtier. So uh, there's a couple benefits there. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's the primary benefit for GMP. Uh, some of the other values are a little bit harder to quantify right now, uh, but we are working towards uh, towards doing that so we can actually uh, increase the value that we uh, represent for energy storage on our grid. Just so a couple more uh, benefits to GMP and the rest of our customers. Uh, the first is energy arbitrage, uh, which is basically taking some real-time energy pricing and uh, using that pricing dynamically to charge and discharge the batteries. Uh, so there are more beneficial, beneficial times to charge the battery and more beneficial times to discharge the battery. And by doing that, we can take advantage of favorable prices in the market, uh, which helps lower costs and keep costs low for all of our customers. Um, we are not currently able to do this, but we are actually, uh, work is just beginning now. Uh, we hope to be able to test this, uh, this type of uh, process within the next year or so, um, and we'll be doing it through an automated uh, process through a distributed energy resource management system, uh, also known as DERMS, uh, in the utility world. So again, we'll hope to we'll hope to have that work uh, complete and being able to use the McKnight Lane uh, as a test bed for for this type of thing within the next year, uh, be a really interesting uh, a learning experience on that. 
And then finally, we have uh, a T and D deferral. So uh, a lot of times, the grid uh, may need upgrades due to increased capacity. Uh, you know, there's the other constraints, like I mentioned before, uh, that will require uh, you know transformer upgrades, wire upgrades, even substation upgrades, uh, which can be really costly for for our ratepayers. Um, so by installing energy storage, uh, distributed energy storage, uh, in places like McKnight Lane where they are going to residential homes, we can either delay uh, or completely alleviate the need for those uh, infrastructure upgrades, uh, which can eliminate some serious costs. Um, so it's, it's a, a cost-benefit analysis that needs to be done, and as the, the cost of storage starts to come down, uh, as it is doing, um, it becomes more and more beneficial for us to, to take advantage of energy storage on the grid. So at McKnight Lane, uh, there's really uh, two primary benefits to the customers uh, in each of these homes. So it's reliability and backup, which, uh, which go hand in hand. So uh, because the system can automatically sense when the grid goes down, it will use its integrated automatic transfer switch to flip into backup mode. Uh, and then when it, when it senses that the grid comes back up, it will go back into just normal operating mode. So these customers can really be comfortable in the fact that they're pretty much going to have power around the clock and around the year. Um, Peter talked a lot about the equipment uh, that was in the homes. Uh, so you can see in this table here, uh, we've backed up a, a significant portion of, of the home. So uh, the heating equipment, uh, the air return, uh, the refrigerator, the lights and plugs, we wanted to make sure we covered uh, the safety and comfort aspects of the home. Um, the total load, uh, the average load for all of those uh, pieces of equipment is, is 1.65 kilowatts. And over a three hour period, uh, that's just about five kilowatt hours. Um, the reason we use three hours is because that's the duration of time that uh, Green Mountain Power uses to uh, try to hit our peaks and reduce that demand. Uh, so we generally size everything, keeping that three hour uh, time frame in mind. Uh, so for 13 of the 14 units, we've installed uh, the Sun and Eco 6, um, which provides three hours of backup for the customer during an outage, uh, and then three hours worth of peak shaving for, for Green Mountain Power. Uh, there's one unit that has a Sonnen Eco 8, which is six, uh, uh, excuse me, it has, it's an 8 kilowatt hour battery, uh, provides five hours of backup for the customer and, and then five hours of peak saving for GMP. Um, and those numbers are significant because the average outage for GMP is, uh, is only two hours. So uh, these customers can really be uh, comfortable knowing that they, they should have power around the clock. Um, additionally, the batteries add an additional layer of benefit. So, Generally speaking, when there is a grid outage, uh, a PV array cannot generate electricity. It just stops functioning until the grid power comes back. Uh, because of the battery installation, the PV can, st can still generate electricity and feed the battery, and the battery can then feed the home. So even in situations where there may be a prolonged outage, which we have had, uh, as long as there is sun, the PV and the battery can provide power to the home for really an endless amount of time uh, so long as there's sun. Uh, so it's really a really good, uh, solid, and unique situation we found ourselves in here, and it's, uh, it's exciting to, to be a part of that. One more thing I'll mention uh, before I go to the next slide is uh, during, um, during an outage, the customer really should not uh, experience any, uh, well, they really shouldn't notice anything going on in the home. So. Uh, any use of uh, the batteries by Green Mountain Power uh, should not be noticed by the customer at all. Um, there may or may not be a blip in time uh, before the battery kicks in for the backup power. Uh, if there is, it's extremely minimal. Um, but if we're using it for peak shaving or, or demand response, uh, the customer won't have any uh, adverse experience whatsoever. They really shouldn't notice that the battery is there at all. Uh, the only, uh, only experience in the home should it should be that they have electricity at all times. All right, finally, I just wanted to talk about our control and, sh and sharing strategy. So uh, part of the program here is, is for uh, Green Mountain Power to test the functionality of the Sonnen systems and energy storage as a whole on our grid. Uh, and we do that by using a distributed energy resource integrator, uh, who <coughs> currently our, our partner in that is Virtual Peaker. Um, 
so they, pro they provide a platform that uh, provides the control mechanism to communicate with these batteries to tell them what to do. Um, you can see here, uh, these screenshots are an example of what our platform would look like. Uh, this would show us some information only. So uh, in these two snapshots, we can see what our uh, total capacity uh, that we have installed in these units are. And then at any given time, what capacity we have available for use for peak shaving or demand response. Uh, we also can see uh, the various batteries and their state of charge. Uh, so we can kind of get a sense of, of what all of our systems are doing at one time. <clears throat> and within the platform, we have the ability to drill down into each individual battery. Uh, we can see a whole bunch of information uh, for each system. Uh, so we can see the battery power, uh, we can see the, the PV coming into the house or into the battery system, we can see what the house is drawing from the battery, and we can see the battery state of charge. Uh, we can see all this stuff numerically and we can see it graphically. Uh, numerically it's nice just to have a quick snapshot, graphically it's great because it allows us to go uh, to you know, look at a historical event uh, to see if what we asked the battery to do, if it performed the right way, uh, if the health of the battery is, is good or not, um, if it's doing what it's supposed to, all that good stuff. And we can, we can get pretty granular with the way we can uh, interact with the battery systems and what kind of information we can pull from it. So uh, it'll be great to be able to start testing these units uh, and then start being able to do some reporting to see, uh, to see if they perform as we expect. And finally, this is just a, uh, a snapshot of how we would do uh, some of the scheduling for events. So generally we would know, uh, <coughs> excuse me, generally we would know a day ahead of time uh, when our event is going to be called, whether it's the annual one or the, or the monthly, uh, monthly peak event. And we can come in here uh, and set the schedule for a given day, a time. Uh, we can set the duration. We can set the desired output of the battery. Uh, we can set this uh, as a one large group. We can group them into smaller groups. Uh, we can do it by individual battery. We really have a lot of granularity as to how, uh, how we control these batteries and what we want them to do. Uh, currently, this is a manual process. Um, however, we are in the process of integrating uh, to make this automated so that we can send signals to, to the system as a whole and it will then disseminate uh, you know, appropriate uh, control commands to the rest of the, the batteries so that they do exactly what we need them to do. And that is the extent of, of my portion here, so I think I'll turn it over to Olaf to talk uh, a little bit more in depth about the batteries. So I appreciate everybody's time. Yeah, thank you, Craig. Uh, that was an excellent, uh, excellent summary, excellent uh, explanation, actually, of our uh, product. Uh, don't really have to add too much to it, but um, uh, and this is really uh, a, a, a great example of, of a group effort. I uh, really want to point this out, uh, including uh, Green Mountain Power, who uh, has been a very a progressive utility and uh, is really interested in uh, uh, bringing forward uh, renewable energies and uh, without them uh, I think this project wouldn't have been able to uh, bring uh, uh, to life uh, including all of the other members of the group. Uh, I had the pleasure to travel to uh, Vermont uh, for the ribbon cutting ceremony and um, it was uh, really uh, you know excellent to see uh, the group effort uh, come to fruition. So just want to touch uh, on uh, actually background on Sonnen, our company, uh, then uh, go a little bit over the product uh, itself and uh, conclude this with how a Sonnen system uh, can have a, an effect uh, on the end customer. So uh, here we go. Uh, Sonnen, uh, obviously a German company, Sonnen means sun in German and uh, we've been established in 2010. Um, to date, uh, we uh, are now in our eighth product generation, uh, have uh, over 13,000 systems installed globally. Uh, our main uh, spots or main markets are obviously Germany, uh, including the UK. Uh, uh, we're uh, present in Australia and in the US. And uh, so this is uh, where uh, we concentrate our market efforts into. Uh, we're worldwide recognized as the first mover and pioneer in the space uh, <clears throat> on the residential energy storage systems 
uh, have been in the market for six years, as I said, uh, our strategy worldwide has uh, been to work with uh, regional installers, and we call them the Sun Battery Centers, uh, that really have, has helped us to understand the markets in uh, the different shades, uh, how they approach. Uh, the local partners uh, are able to uh, work with the end customers, uh, have great relationships with the HJs and the utilities, so they understand what's necessary and uh, therefore they can also provide us with great feedback what's uh, necessary uh, in, uh, for adjustments in the certain regions. And uh, last but not least, uh, we've been shipping products in the US since uh, the end of 2015, uh, so uh, not the date we're uh, in the market for over 12 months uh, pretty successfully. Uh, in the US we have shipped uh, more than 500 units, uh, are in more than 40 different states, and uh, that really speaks to the flexibility of our product and our control platform. Our uh, Sonnen uh, system, so this is uh, a, an example here on the left, uh, how it would look like an uh, eco uh, 4, 6 or 8, similar to what we have installed uh, at uh, the Big Night Lane project. Uh, our system works great with new and also with existing uh, PV systems. Uh, the main application, uh, main applications are solar self-consumption, uh, time of use arbitrage, uh, we do great uh, with grid type backup power, and on top of it our control platform is fantastic to integrate um, and help for any utility applications. But just to elaborate on the, the applications, so solar self-consumption, uh, that is really the underlying algorithm uh, that uh, most of our systems are set on, uh, so um, obviously there's uh, in many areas a uh, big discrepancy between when uh, you uh, produce PV power uh, or power from, from solar and when uh, you use it. So typically uh, we use a little bit of energy in the morning, we brew our a cup of coffee and uh, turn on the lights to get up uh, and then we leave the house, right? Uh, our kids go to school, uh, we go to work and uh, then we just come home in the evening uh, when uh, the sun is coming down, uh, turn on air conditioner or heat pump, uh, watch TV, etc. do our daily activities. And so there's a big discrepancy between you produce renewable energy and when you use it. And uh, that was really the idea why our two founders uh, uh, in, uh, introduced uh, energy storage and uh, crafted uh, the self-consumption algorithm uh, onto it. Uh, uh, another uh, great example of how end users can save money is the time of use arbitrage. Uh, we see more and more time of use rates uh, coming from the utilities, uh, which helps them to allocate and, and determine when energy is actually most expensive to produce and uh, kind of help people to uh, using energy more wisely. So uh, our systems can then surgically uh, discharge energy into the users and, and help customers not to draw energy from the grid when it's most expensive. Then a grid type backup power, I will go into this uh, at a later point and utility applications uh, great, give a great, uh, great overview over how our systems, as uh, if they're combined into a swarm or into a virtual power plant, uh, how they can help uh, utilities uh, save money uh, in, in their operations. Uh, so the Sonnen uh, Eco, uh, one of our products, uh, the, uh, you actually see me here uh, right next to Eco 6, uh, to the product itself. Uh, it's centered around a lithium iron phosphate battery. Uh, it's the safest uh, one of the safest lithium chemistries that you can find, and therefore we chose this for the residential application. Uh, it can provide 100% depth of discharge, uh, 10,000 cycles, and uh, we're able to wrap a 10-year warranty around the whole uh, integrated system. Uh, an integrated system means that all of the components that you need for a comprehensive energy storage system are built inside. So that's your bidirectional inverter, your batteries obviously, your control platform, battery management system, communication modules. So everything is inside of uh, this um, sleek uh, 
uh, form factor, and uh, therefore it's it's just um, an excellent product because you have everything uh, just right inside. Uh, we can produce up to 8 kW of power output, so uh, continuous power uh, discharge and also uh, charge power. Uh, we offer seven different sizes between 4 and 16 kilowatt hours of capacity, so that really helps uh, installers and, and builders to uh, determine very specifically how much energy uh, is needed and uh, which system size needs to be installed. We have very flexible controls and uh, our uh, great installer network really helps us uh, to bring the product to the market wherever uh, we have uh, big demand for it. Then uh, just a little touching on the business case uh, on the low income net zero resilient community. Uh, it really, really speaks to uh, our mission because Sonnen's mission is to, to bring clean and affordable energy to everybody. And uh, there couldn't have been a better example uh, here in the US uh, because it combines all of those uh, items, all of those components of our mission statement and uh, distills it to, uh, to make a uh, uh, project. So um, there we have been able to work together with Green Mountain Power, pull uh, some of that uh, revenue and share it uh, with the end customers uh, to help with the installation cost. Um, we uh, are also setting an example uh, uh, with Green Mountain Power uh, because they will be offering those energy storage systems to the end customers uh, on an ongoing basis going forward. Uh, so uh, you can uh, uh, install those systems uh, to provide the benefit uh, for yourself. Uh, the benefit uh, will be uh, mostly backup in, in Vermont, and, uh, but uh, because these customers will also help uh, Green Mountain Power to save uh, cost on their end, uh, they will get a, an on-bill credit uh, from them. So it's a really a win-win scenario uh, that uh, is, is very unique uh, to Vermont. Uh, but uh, we will uh, definitely uh, try to duplicate those efforts and bring this to uh, other areas in the U.S. And I think uh, having set this uh, example uh, will help uh, to educate the uh, uh, public and also different utilities of what's possible today. <coughs> so um, just a quick summary, uh, what does the uh, uh, this project bring to the end customer. So we were able to trans transform the abandoned mobile uh, home park into a net zero community. Uh, the residents uh, will drastically reduce their electric bills for the duration of, this, of their stay. Uh, the homeowners will be able to keep the lights on when the grid uh, ever would go down. Uh, we're allowing Green Mountain Power to perform uh, demand response and other utility services and uh, they were able to uh, put forward some of those cost savings uh, to finance the project. Um, last but not least, uh, the, uh, out of those um, four main applications of song battery, uh, we are mostly focusing on two various streams, which is uh, backup and utility applications. So uh, net metering program is still uh, Giving one-to-one -one credit uh, in the area and time of use is also not uh, uh, introduced. So uh, the biggest value stream to the end customer is backup. Uh, we have seen quite a few um, uh, yeah, winters in, in the Northeast and they're coming back every winter. So uh, obviously there's some trees that are uh, getting toppled down. So it's just uh, you know part of the nature and um, uh, we're uh, also seen a couple of, of natural disasters that have uh, hit the East Coast uh, especially and some of them uh, like a winter storm uh, could knock out the power for a couple hours until it gets restored and a couple of the other uh, disasters take a little longer until utilities are able to restore power. So uh, a tropical storm Hermine that occurred in August and September 2016 was actually one of the first events where 
uh, we have had product in the market already and uh, literally what happened uh, is uh, the outer bands of uh, Hurricane Hermine uh, hit or started to hit and uh, we uh, just had installed an energy storage system at, uh, at uh, this customer's uh, home. We verified that everything was up and running and uh, they were literally that house in the neighborhood. They were uh, next morning people start to uh, uh, dig out of their uh, out of their homes and, and just you know assess the damage uh, after the storm uh, dissipated and their home was the only one uh, that uh, had lights on uh, people heard the air conditioner humming and uh, they were really surprised that uh, somebody actually had power so uh, this is the peace of mind that uh, Sana is able to bring to the end customers and this is why uh, people will be willing to spend and invest in energy storage and uh, then if we can work together with a uh, forward thinking utility like Green Mountain Power, there's really a win-win scenario and uh, we will be successful to bring clean and affordable energy uh, to everybody. So uh, thank you so much, uh, thanks for your attention and that was uh, my part. Great, thank you, Olaf. Um, so it looks like Todd, uh, our host, has been knocked off the audio. Um, one moment, please. So we're just going to start answering a few questions. We uh, do have a lot of people on the line and a lot of questions coming in. So um, our guest speakers, please just feel free to jump in um, if there's a question that you want to answer. So uh, we have a question here. Um, does the size of storage capacity depend on the solar PV system size? And what is the relationship between the two? Yeah, this is Craig. I'll take a first crack at that. So, so not really is the answer. <clears throat> um, the size of the storage, and Olaf, you might be able to speak this a little bit better than me, but uh, the size of the storage is really dependent on how much of the house uh, we want to back up. So, if uh, if we want to back up just critical loads, um, you know, like the heating system or refrigeration or, or chest freezer, in a lot of cases in Vermont. Uh, we would take the, the total load of all of those appliances and, and factor in the, the size of the battery that way. Um, the size of the solar uh, is more dependent on how much, it, how much of that battery is going to be charged from the sun versus coming in from the grid. So uh, they're really almost independent of one another. Uh, there are limitations based on the different sizes of uh, inverters and stuff involved in, in uh, each piece of equipment, but uh, generally speaking, no, the two are not directly linked. Hey, Samantha, this is Todd. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Thanks, Todd. Okay, I apologize. I was bumped off somehow. Um, if you can give me the question box back, I can participate again in this webinar. Perfect. And while Todd is setting up, uh, just want to uh, add on to this. Um, absolutely, uh, there are uh, two, um, I would say, uh, dimensions of, of the sizing uh, for, for backup. And number one is uh, how much capacity uh, you want to provide to the end customer to bring them through the night. Uh, that's based on a, on a load assessment that you, uh, you uh, or the installer typically uh, does uh, so we're we're looking at all of the different devices, how much energy they draw, and how long they would run. For example, just you know, for example, a refrigerator uh, does have a certain power requirement, but it's not on all the time. So there we can calculate how much energy you need, and then the other uh, component is uh, how much uh, power you would need at any single uh, moment. So uh, air conditioners uh, or uh, if you 
were to back up a well pump, for example, you have a certain start startup requirement, and so this is uh, something that uh, our system would need to provide in a, in a form from uh, coming from the inverter. Uh, but then maybe the limitation or the, the info on how it is combined with the PV system. Uh, so we uh, just typically need to make sure that uh, our inverter that's built in and that's dedicated to the battery uh, has uh, the capacity to absorb uh, the maximum amount of PV power that's getting uh, imported into the batteries. Okay, thanks. Uh, I still don't have the question box, but I, I did, while we're, while we're doing that, um, I did review some of the questions earlier. So um, a couple people wanted to know about the, the roof. It looks like the roofs are fairly flat, not completely flat. So then uh, a couple of people had asked about snow and whether that flat pitch works well with the solar. Yeah, this is Peter. Um, so uh, I noted just how this works well. It's, it, there's a, a few pieces um, that contribute to this decision. One is uh, these are modular homes, and um, the most cost-effective approach is to deliver these homes completed to the site. Um, and this is for McKnight and, and all the other projects. So you can only travel down the road at 13 and a half feet in height, and that includes the trailer on which the home travels. So we need to stick with a shallow pitch roof to do that. Otherwise, um, you have the expense of actually building a roof on site, which makes these a little bit uh, less cost effective. Um, I also noted as far as the orientation of these homes, rarely do we come across a mobile home site where uh, we have the ideal orientation um, and hence, you know, having a pitched roof, 30 to 45 degrees, say, um, would work. Uh, and so we sort of take a sort of commercial solar installation approach. It's, um, it's uh, less costly to install. We put all the racking, inverters, all the wiring is completed in the factory. Um, the modules are delivered to the site with the home, and um, in a matter of a couple hours, the, the solar system's in place, and when the home's energized, it's up and running. So, um, you know, with regards to snow, that, that does eliminate solar production in parts of the winter here, um, but that's also when our sun is really low in the sky, um, and we actually have very cloudy weather in November, December, and the first half of January. So. Um, what we find is with a about a 6kW system as we have at McKnight, uh, we'll, prob we'll probably see as we have in other homes with um, several years of post-occupancy data, we'll see close to 7,000 kilowatt hours in production in our climate with a 212 pitch roof, so a pretty flat pitch roof, um, even with uh, snow loading. Okay, thank you. We also had some questions about cost. And I know um, we may not be able to give a, a hard number, but can you uh, you and maybe Olaf address uh, the cost? But I think more importantly, you know, what's the cost benefit? What's the value picture for these systems? Because we did a uh, sort of analysis for follow-on a potential follow-on project, and it, it appeared that there was a pretty reasonable uh, payback or, you know, break even for these systems. Can you speak to that? Um, well, this is Peter, and um, I'll just note a couple of things. Uh, so one, with regards to the solar system, uh, the way that the manufacturer, Vermont, installs these solar systems, uh, they go on at about $2.30 per watt. Um, in the state of Vermont, um, we've had a incentive program for low-income homeowners getting into these mobile home replacement units uh, that provides a dollar per watt incentive. Um, and so pretty low cost for the solar aspect of this. Um, and with regards to the batteries, um, I'll let Olaf or Craig expand upon it, but ultimately um, this is a really attractive piece to our 
home buyers and our the tenants for McKnight Lane. Uh, they're looking for a backup source. Um, a lot of Vermont is rural. Um, we have very good grid reliability, but um, particularly with an all-electric house, we're not putting wood stoves in these homes. Um, you know, having the comfort of uh, several hours of a backup source built into the home is, is very attractive. Um, and so this has been really appealing not only for this project and Addison County Community Trust and their tenants, but um, we have a lot of interest in this as a component uh, to our mobile home replacement unit. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so, uh, yeah, cost factors absolutely it depends on the size. Our systems start uh, below ten thousand dollars with the backup feature included, and uh, uh, just go up, go up. Uh, you know, depending on the size. Um, just wanted to mention that uh, rebates or incentives are available. Uh, so the federal tax credit uh, would also apply if you install it together with solar. So in this case, it does. And then uh, we do have uh, different value streams that uh, talked about. Uh, in different areas, we find uh, different value streams that are more uh, or less important. Uh, so uh, it could be a self-consumption uh, model that works works out great or that provides the uh, payback at the time of use. In that case, it was the utility application. And of course, the backup feature, uh, you could compare this to the cost of a, of a, of a generator. I couldn't imagine uh, having a net zero community uh, with a, 14 generator sets uh, around it. So uh, we really uh, do see uh, this backup feature as not just a single purpose device, but a multi-purpose device. And uh, therefore, uh, the costs are definitely justified. This is Elise. I just want to add one more aspect of cost savings to having the batteries, which is on uh, ACCT is the management company. Um, one of our most common um, emergency calls, uh, especially in the winter, um, is for when the power goes out and there's no heat somewhere. We have a couple of properties with pellet boilers and, um, you know, maybe maybe up once a month or so uh, we have an on-call incident where they lose heat and we have to deploy our maintenance techs um, and that can get very costly for us. So we're expecting this to um, have lower maintenance costs as a result of that. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting, a uh, couple of interesting aspects I just wanted to point out. One is that on uh, in a lot of cases for rural, uh, you know, low low income and affordable housing, uh, you know, people are living in a place where they're they ha they have a wood stove, perhaps to you know sort of fall back on when they if the grid goes out during the winter months and. So these, this is a different system where it's all electric and the the heating is included, among, you know, as part of the uh, critical loads that are backed up by the battery and the solar in case the system has to island in grid outage. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was that in terms of costs and benefits, um, ideally. You know, when we look at replicating the system, we are looking at, uh, you know, in the next project, having one of the entities, whether it's a utility or, or somebody else, be able to take full advantage of the federal uh, investment tax credit and accelerated depreciation on both the solar and the storage. And you can do that with, with energy storage uh, the same as you can with solar. Uh, in this particular case, because of the way that the uh, project came together and the financing came together, uh, nobody was able to take those tax benefits. So we were fortunate to get some foundation support from High Meadows Fund and Vermont Community Foundation Sustainable Future Fund, and also some additional funding uh, and, te and uh, technical assistance support from U.S. DOE Office of Electricity and San Diego National Laboratories, for which we're quite grateful. And that really allowed this project to go forward. But uh, we we think, and we've done some an, a preliminary analysis on this, that uh, if in a future project one of the entities could take those tax benefits 
and you have a utility that can, as Green Mountain Power is do, doing, use these systems to reduce its costs and the cost to its ratepayers, uh, that the system really pays for itself in uh, within 10 years. And um, that's, you know, it, it's quite a uh, statement for something like, uh, you know, energy storage, a technology that, um, you know, used to be, or up until very recently, and still in a lot of places, considered uh, something new and unknown and expensive. In fact, uh, it's being used widely in this country and in Europe and other places around the globe, and it's becoming more and more affordable every minute. But finally, I just want to point out that um, Craig had mentioned that GMP is, is figuring out how to use some of these distributed storage systems for arbitrage, which is simply means buying power when the price is low, storing it in batteries, and then you know discharging those batteries when the price of power is high so that you get a delta, you get a, a price differential there that, that is a cost savings. And so as more and more applications for these systems become available, such as arbitrage, and you could imagine others, uh, you know, ancillary services and so forth, uh, the, the cost-benefit picture just improves. So it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite an exciting uh, outlook for these batteries. I think we're just about out of time. Samantha, um, do we have any final words that we need to say? Um, well, I wanted to leave everyone with uh, some of the links where they can find out more information about this project on our website. Um, resilient-power.org uh, is the Resilient Power Project homepage, and you can also find information about the project on the um, CISA's SDAP page, and that's CISA.org. There's also some contact info on the screen. I know a lot of questions came in that we didn't get to, um, so if you'd like to follow up with us, um, you're welcome to. And we'll also be sending out a recording of this webinar along with a copy of the slides and an email uh, probably later today. Okay, thanks very much. So thanks everybody uh, who, who attended, and thanks to all our presenters. And uh, I apologize we didn't get to all the questions, but uh, I think it was it was quite a good presentation. So thanks to Elise, Peter, Craig, and Olaf. And uh, everybody have a wonderful holiday, and we will see you in our next webinar probably in January.